I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. This is part two with our guest Don from the Navajo people, and uh, we're going to start the recording right in progress. It stopped on us last time, but I think he's still talking about the same incident. So, with that, here we go. Where's your phone? Let's see the picture. And he um, he said he deleted it, and I was like, why in the world would you delete it? And he said that he had to because he was having nightmares, and he couldn't sleep for three days. He was having nightmares after nightmares. And on the third day, he finally deleted it. He said that um, the nightmares were like he each and every day that he was getting closer to his house, like he knew Bigfoot knew where he lives because he lives about two miles away from that spring off that mountain. So each and every night he dreamed that Bigfoot's making his journey closer to his house. And on the third day when he was sleeping that night, he said that Bigfoot got to his door and it was locked. And he said that he was watching him sleep through the window and, you know, just walking around the house. And he finally deleted off his phone and the nightmares went away and then that's when we showed up and what what we did was we dragged him into the ride we drove right up sorry about that Mm -hmm. my notification we drove right up to the spring and we started tracking my wife and i and the whole time we were there i was watching him he was just you know, just shifting, looking around his over his shoulders, and his uh, he started to get a little red and a little sweaty. And I asked him, "Are you all right? Are you okay?" And he told me he doesn't feel good. You see, he feels like he's watching him right now, and he's just looking around. I told him, "It's all right. We're gonna figure this out together." <laughs> and you seen something, so we're gonna get to the bottom of what you seen. And um, I went to where he seen that huge uh, black Bigfoot sitting. I walked up to the boulder. It was like about see six foot five, and he he said that he was sitting on it like a normal chair, just just lounging, just relaxing. He said he didn't know he was there. He was dark. He didn't know he was there in between the trees till he sat up. He said. He sat up and really leaned towards them and really looked at him, you know. And we were doing the measurements. It was like, wow, this guy had to be like maybe 20, maybe 17 feet, you know. Who knows? And we started looking on the ground, and we saw tracks like at least 22, probably even more, 22 inches long and about probably 10 inches wide. The heel was probably like five inches wide. And, you know, I was just like, wow, he really did take off. And each stride was like six feet, six, probably six and a half feet. He started out five feet in his stride, and he started going wider, longer strides, and he started running on the rock, and I lost him. And my wife went back down to the waterfall, and she found two tracks. She called me, I went down there. And we found um, the first track was uh, like 18, 17 inches long. It's a little bit smaller than the bigger one. And then we found a third one was like, um, I wore a size 13. So it was like, like a size 13, but it was way wider than my foot. Everything was just, was just bigger. And we tracked them for like about, we, we tracked them for about good ways. And up the road, Daddy finally came around and met them. All three met up right there, and they went straight up to Navajo Mountain. Yeah, that's uh, that's um, one of the first times you know being around that out there. 
Napa Mountain area. Yeah, and then the uh, other times, you know, I was just like uh, in Douglas Mesa at 19, and my uncle, he went outside to relieve himself, you know, to use the restroom, and I heard him kind of make that noise, like, oh, like, like someone reached behind, reached behind him and scared him, you know, like his whole body, he made that noise, and he's not, he's not really much of a scared person, and I ran out the door, me and my cousins, we ran out, and he told me that he, he seen something, you know, really huge run down that road, and I took off down that road, and all I ran into was just a foul odor, you know, that's, that's the that's the, probably like the closest second time I ever got I was just running into that order because that huge mesa just drops off into a canyon so I ran to that cliff and it was evening time and you know whatever it was and you know it's easy to hide amongst the trees around that cliff yeah but all my other encounters were just mainly um probably just uh the unexplained, like, um, when we were younger, like, a lot of my family, they would come back from all corners of the country, and we all go spotlighting. We go spotlighting around Miami Valley area. Within about three hours, you know, we, we start seeing, one time we seen the, uh, the wolf man, you would say, you know, a werewolf. You know, it's, if you look at cedar trees, you know, the, the highest of the cedar trees, like, 15 feet, you know, it's not 20, but this guy was like towering over that tree, looking down right at us while we're spotlighting. You know, that's how huge this guy was. And it looked just like a wolf, you know, showing us his teeth and started grabbing dirt and rocks and throwing at us. And we were spotlighting with three trucks we all had. We all had like at least two spotlights on each truck and we all had probably two or three rifles and nobody did not want to shoot it. <laughs> nobody didn't want to like do a warning shot in the air at least because some of my cousins were there were like at the age 12, nine years old and I myself was 13 and we got chased all the way back to my grandma's and they were just harassing us all night. You know, we were at the trailer. My uncle, uh, we all got barricaded in the trailer. And so the sun finally came up. It just sounded like a lot of horses running away in the distance. You just hear them running away. But yeah, that's uh, a lot of a lot of strange things come at night especially when you're spotlighting and you're just putting out like a huge huge call at night there and you don't know what's going to show up Bigfoot shows up you know or Skinwalker shows up or a werewolf will show up you never really know around here and um, there's also a goat man that runs around too really uh, unexplainable but uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, people that have you know, eyewitness account, first hand account about that that I work with. And I really want to, you know, start recording the stories too <laughs> one day if I have a chance in time. But do you guys have any uh, other questions? Well, I'm curious about do you have, uh, have you had any disappearances of people that might have been attributed to uh, Bigfoot in that area? Yeah, we uh, we have a lot of uh, missing and murdered uh, indigenous women, and we're like one of the top places in the country with not only missing women but missing you know, young adults and missing adults that are still have not been found. And this is just here on our reservation. And you know, um, I yeah. You know, I can relate to, to what you're saying about that because um, in my area, I have the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribe, and uh, they they know what I do. I'm, they're familiar with me uh, and, and going out there and kind of looking around a lot. But uh, they have stories of 
over, you know, hundreds of years of many women and children disappearing. And uh, I was actually told that it was mm-hmm. uh, it was Bigfoot that took them. Mm. Yep. We have a similar account. It's not if it's not the uh, shapeshifters that take them, you know, they use them for the rituals, too. If it's not them, it's, uh, you know, Yeito, because underneath our reservation, we have miles and miles of tunnels that run east, west, north, and south. And even um, is told to us by our uh, grandparents, you know, be careful because he, t- he in the caves, goes deep on the ground. And if you look on the map, like a topography map, we, it's really rugged here. And each, you know, in Black Mesa, we have Black Mesa, White Mesa, Navajo Mountain, and um, around Halchita area, there's this volcano, and all the way to Shiprock, New Mexico. I don't know if you guys know that Shiprock and the Chusco Mountains, there's a huge tunnel system that runs on the ground that connects all these areas together on the ground. And they take in during the day and at night they come out. They come out and uh, cruise around the, sh- the creeks. Yeah, I've, I've heard that tale because uh, we actually, um, um, <clears throat> they used to like to scare us when we were, <laughs> I had, uh, uh, we had a Navajo, uh, actual um, Navajo that worked for us on uh, uh, one of our archaeological sites. And uh, he used to like to scare us at night telling us about the stories about the um uh, <laughs> Uh, the shapeshifters and the the uh, little people and everything else that would come out of the tunnels out there around Shiprock and then and then the ghost lights and then when we actually saw the ghost lights uh, that was when I was like oh you know we kind of took it all as a big as you know as fairy tales at first is the way we looked at it um, yeah. and um, I'm trying to remember what he used to call us the Bill is it the Bilgani or Bilgani Bilgana the, 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 the term yeah, the Ghana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, white yeah. people. <laughs> Dumb <Yeah>. white people. <laughs> and, no, uh, no, just, no, no, it actually and, uh, means, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, he would, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it just means white people is what it means. But uh, um, anyway, he would tell us about that. We all kind of took it as being fairy tales until we sat and watched the, the ghost lights one night. And then everybody was going, uh, he's been telling us the truth and this is, this stuff really hmm. exists, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty strange. Like some places, I think, like it retains the uh, trauma of past. You know, like a lot of horror. We don't have a lot of a uh, pretty history. It's a lot of a uh, dark, sad, and gruesome history. And I think some parts actually might have that past trauma like play out because certain places like there's this one uh, Mesa called the uh, Hashkehani Mesa. I guess we had a chief that evaded captivity during the genocide days. He lived up on that Mesa. It was a stronghold. And if you camp around there, it's pretty high elevation. When you camp out there, I guess like every time at three in the morning, they call him the runner. It's everyone that camps near that Mesa underneath there they hear someone running and then they get up out of their tents. They hear someone breathing and they look and all they see is a torch by itself coming down the trail. They can't see that person. They can just hear him and he's running with the torch all the way and he zigzags all the way up the mesa and he waves. And I guess back in the day, that was his, that was a signal. They're coming, go, go figure out where you're going to run and hide for the day and get ready to fight. The men would get ready to fight and lay down their lives for the children and the women. I guess that, that's the trauma that kind of plays out over and over in some places. And it's, there's a hauntings. Hauntings are really uh, a thing. Like we have, uh, we're told not to pick up hitchhikers at a certain time. <laughs> some of the roads are pretty haunted too. Yeah, well, but the translation, Balagana, it actually translates to uh like uh we we fight within them we we fight we wrestle with them that's 
would it like translate like like if I say let's fight, I say like tika, you know. Mm-hmm. Then like if I say like if I say war, kea skeije kea ika. Like we say the those two people are fighting a huge land war over land. You know, and then but back then when when it was still the war days, it was a different name that we had for uh, white people. It was a uh, Dajagani. In translation it means you fight them, you fight and kill them. And then since we're not at war anymore, it changed to Bilagana, like we wrestle with them with inside. So it's huh. translation. Well, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you clarified that because we all, all the time thought he was just telling us we were dumb white people. <laughs> of, course we probably, of course we probably were. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's always nice to translate our languages it's pretty it's pretty uh it's nice <laughs> it's like wor- three <laughs> words and one one word you know it's always put out yeah. like that <laughs> yeah and um yeah we have uh little people too that run around out there in Miami valley navajo mountain but um with all those stories i need to go out and and get them and present them to you guys <laughs> yeah and um before it got colder here Back in November, I went hiking up in uh, White Mesa. There's this place called Bottle Rock. Or, uh, my bad, my bad. It's uh, Square Butte and White Mesa. The elevation to the top of White Mesa is uh, 7,200 feet. So it's, it's pretty pretty intense hike. Right now, Kailato, we're at 6,000 feet elevation. So you have to go up and down, up and down. You climb all the way up. and So along the way... Um, we went hiking right after a quick little uh, shower, and we started going up um, Square Butte first, and um, we found a track. Uh, I have pictures of it. You know, uh, I only I don't know if uh, you guys want to see them, but it's not the best quality. But I have yet to go back up to that mesa. It's Don, we um, never say no to pictures. Absolutely. <laughs> always always interested, Don. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is a this is a strange set of foot tracks, but in the middle you can see what um you guys call that thermal ridge crust, right? Where it separates the hill in the front. And with the track where it, where it's split in the middle. So this the picture it has that it has that imprint. It's pretty long. It's it's a strange looking track. You know, I've never seen anything like that. And I took a few pictures of that, and we we tracked it down. We swallowed into a, a cave. Um, I tried telling uh, my nephew to go in there and take a peek, and he, <laughs> for some strange reason, he didn't want to. <laughs> And I said, if I see your mom, I'm going to tell her you're a girl going there. And he didn't want it. <laughs> so I was like, well, for a good reason, I guess. Maybe we shouldn't bother it because it's just raining. Maybe that thing's in there looking at us. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we were just there looking around. And, you know, it was, just, it was just strange silence. And the road was just right down there. And, and two years ago, my wife and I were non-medical emergency drivers. And um, one of the client, his daughter, came forward with the story. Um, he lived in Navajo Mountain. He got picked up. And when they were cruising around that right area, right the same area, um, Square Butte, it's a pretty uh, curvy area. I guess uh, the driver, he stopped. He went to a complete stop. And the client's um, daughter said her dad was there. He got up. He asked him why. It was like four in the morning. He said, like, "Why'd you stop?" And he told him, "There's something on the road." And he looked up. And he said, "There's like a huge, like like a huge man with a with a trench coat standing in the middle." And I guess the old man was like, "All right, let me tell him to get off the road because someone's gonna hit him." And it's raining. I guess it was raining at the time. And he got out with his uh, flashlight. He's walking up to him, speaking to him in Navajo, saying, what are you doing right here? You shouldn't be right here. You're going to cause a huge accident. You're going to kill somebody. You're going to hurt somebody. Are you okay? 
what's wrong with you? You know, you're not, what you're doing is not right right now. Are you fine? As he got closer, and he noticed that the hair was pretty long, the head was down, and I guess it stood up. As it stood up, he said, was, he knows he thought it was a furry jacket, but it was a long, long hair. And I guess the old man said that he stood up at least 26 feet, 26 <laughs> feet tall. And he started uh, swaying back and forth, too. His arm was swaying, too. And he was uh, started growling at the old man. But the old man was just looking at him. The old man managed to take pictures. And um, uh, the driver, he was a young young boy, and he just started backing up with the van. He just he just straight up left the old man, and he was honking the horn. And then um, the old man told him, "You got you need to leave. You're gonna hurt somebody." And I guess that he said it was Bigfoot. He said he started screaming and howling. And it jumped down, jumped off the road down the little cliff running all the way down. I guess it's a really thick, it's a really, uh, it's, uh, I got to show you guys, you guys got to come here. You guys got to look at, there's so much stories here with my coworkers shared me about that wash that goes all from White Mesa. The north is Navajo Mountain and there's just uh, canyons and in our language is called Chaya, you know, like really thick, weavy areas like way down there where all the waters drain out into Lake Powell. So it was canyons out there, canyons and mazes. You know, so they seen him running down there. And, and I guess the old man, he's pretty distraught. And uh, he told his wife and he had to get a ceremony done. The medicine man told him that you need to delete those pictures because he knows you took a picture. He knows where you live. He's going to come and find you. Told him that. So it's... It's kind of hard being Navajo and trying to pursue Bigfoot because I'm like you guys, I have so much questions and I would like to find out more. But a lot of our people say, no, leave them alone. You know, there's a reason why people are missing here. <laughs> well, we get the same problem here. Uh, it sounds like you sent us an invite, like maybe we could all sit around a campfire and share stories with you sometime. Oh, yeah, yeah, but I'll probably be on the listening end to you guys. <laughs> I'll forget. I'll just be like a podcast in real life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think it'll be, I think it'll be a two-way street for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a coworker uh, this past summer share me a story about that same area. He said um, about four years back, him and his cousins, they were all spotlighting going down there to the family land. They have a family uh, sheep camp down there. In the hot summers, um, being down there in the canyon is pretty nice and cool sometimes. But my family, my in-laws here, they have stories of uh, being harassed by, they say, like hairy monkeys down there. And they see him jump from cliff 40 feet, 40 feet, like to cliff to the other side of the cliff, back and forth and all the way down zigzagging towards them. And there's an outhouse down there. Like when they... When they're going to the restroom the next morning, they see all they see is something really black and hairy digging inside beside the outhouse, digging into where where all the poop is and digging I've out. I've heard that before. That's uh take a pass on that. Maybe that's where some of the stink comes from. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. And my, my aunt and my sister in law, they said they just stopped and they realized that thing was so huge and they saw it finally dig up all the uh, poop, and it started making weird noises. And they said they're just standing there frozen with shock and fright that they finally managed to turn around and decide they don't need to go to the restroom. They ran back to the tent. And um, another story, too, is uh, I guess um, my coworker, he, was, he went down there spotlighting with his cousins and his uncle, and he was with the spotlight. They got to the bottom. He was just looking at the cliffs. And he said he shined the light right at a rock, a huge rock. And he said he saw huge red eyes. And he saw over the rock was a huge hairy red arms with real long claws. He, he showed, he, he, I had my hands down. 
and he said, put your other hand by your hand. And he's all like, it was like two and a half of your hand, he said. He said it was a huge hand, just like his hands was just draped over the rock. And he said it was, he all he saw was his red eyes and just real hairy, real furry and red, he said. And once he seen it, he I guess he kind of jumped back and told everyone what he seen. And, and his uncle, they made a perimeter around the truck. And I guess his uncle had, was having a little bit of a few that night, too. And he just hopped in the truck, locked himself in, and passed out on his nephews. Oh. <laughs> and, oh. they said, <laughs> and they said that uh, they were just back-to-back looking everywhere for hours, and finally they heard a coyote. And they, they said the, the air, the, the whole area just went easy, and they were finally able to go to sleep. So... There's a there's a lot of areas like Kaibato Cave. There's a huge cave inside the mesa that the locals used to um, go and enjoy in the summer. Summer's day is really hot here too. They would go there, camp, and you know um, barbecue. But like around the nineties, nineties in the uh, early two thousands, they said they got they got chased away. Something started living inside the cave, and all the locals said it was Bigfoot. He he moved in. He didn't like what's going on. And back then, the Kaibato community had no street lights, and he would he would bother everyone's um dogs, livestock. He'd peek in windows, climb on top of their house, you know, and just bother their clothes that's hanging out on the clothesline. Some clothes are missing. Kids are missing. And finally, they started putting up street lights, and. So if you cruise around here on the Navajo Nation, every home has a light. And the ones that don't have the light are the ones with most likely with some trauma stories that they don't really like speaking about. <laughs> but yeah, everyone doesn't really talk about Bigfoot. They don't want to or any of the stuff I'm speaking to you tonight. It's a huge taboo, but, you know, I think everything done in the light needs to be, everything done in the dark needs to be exposed to the light sometimes, you know. I agree. I agree entirely. And I've talked to some other people that are Native friends who are saying, mirroring exactly what you're talking about today. So pretty interesting. You know, it's it's important for Mm. people's safety if stuff is aired once in a while. At least so people can be aware of things that are going on and maybe, you know, kind of stay away from bad situations. Mm -hmm. The only only ones that um, really take those cases seriously these days are the Navajo Rangers. (laughs) But, you know. I was curious about that. I was going to ask you because I've seen some interviews with some of the tribal police and the Rangers. uh, And I think they know a whole lot more than what they're letting on what are your thoughts uh it's uh basically everything that they present saying like bigfoot and ufo connections that they have connection they said like what i've seen on youtube you know and a lot of them you know i say it's pretty legit and really i guess they they done their work you know i would say um you know like I seen a UFO here as well, my wife and I, about three years ago. We are uh, going up the hill, and it was just, I'm not sure how high, but it was like a fireball, but it was shining different lights. And I was going up the hill at the time, and my wife and I were looking at it. It was all big, watch this. And I started doing high beam, low beam. I turned my left, my right signal on, caution on, and I started doing some crazy sequence with it. And the light, that UFO started shining different colors and it shined a bright light towards us. And then my wife, she she got freaked out. She smacked my arm. And I did it again. She's all, oh, and I did it again. I was like, this is, this is for scientific research, you know? 
She didn't want and to become an abduct too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She didn't want to get abducted. She got abducted one time. She has a her family, they all got abducted one time. They were sleeping in the truck. They were driving down the freeway. And when they got put back down, the two ants were switched. One was on the passenger. One was driving. Oh, no. That's what they noticed. Yeah. She she smacked me again. She was like, I don't want to get taken again. I don't remember. <laughs> so I told her I won't do it again. And we saw that thing just, just go right up into the sky. <sighs> Think of an eye. But, yeah, it was pretty interesting. It was just, uh, you know, just an observatory, see how they would react. But, yeah, that was pretty awesome, that part. Um, you guys have any other questions? I'd love to talk to you again. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to talk to you sometime. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll bear giving your phone number because uh, I'd like to hear some of the uh, stories of the Dene. <laughs> um, oh yeah having, yeah because having done my field school down in that area and actually having worked with a uh, navajo um i i it's quite quite interesting and uh, so now y'all had a long-standing history of uh uh with uh, and weren't didn't y'all fight with the uh, against the pueblo people down there um yeah yeah we had a uh, quarrels um like a lot of the times we we lived in peace, we tolerated each other, you know, like a lot of our teachings are different. It's more like um it's more like being in the same area as somebody and saying, "I respect you, you know, I have things that I can teach you, and there's things that I don't have to teach you, and likewise for you, there's things that you can teach me and there's things that you don't have to teach me and I'm not going to force my way in my teachings again upon you because you have your own life. You know, life is sacred. But however, there are times where we started, um, you know, fighting against each other because it goes all the way, goes way back. The uh, University of uh, New Mexico uh, basically found uh, ruins these ruins are a little different. They, they said that it was like more Navajo architectural, Hogans and mm-hmm. different towers. And because we have clans that come from there, that same background that comes from out of them, amongst them. Like mm-hmm. my wife, she's a salt clan, and that salt clan comes all the way from Chaco Canyon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, was and this so, an area where there were a lot of towers and such? Because I'm thinking that I might have seen this. Yeah, or uh, it was they a have a lot of ta- high towers and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's a, on a webinar. Um, I like to watch archaeological. You know what they find the uh, the school. Yeah. I like to try to keep up with that these days. Did they ever? Yeah, did they, they found, ever tell you about why they put the uh, the uh, that if you go in these ruins and you'll see uh, like little doorways very close to the ground, yeah. but they're small. They're like almost little teeny tiny windows looking looking out and and we were like you know wandering around in there and again uh our, the the gentleman and i wished i could remember his name now that was navajo that worked with us that um I, we were thinking this was some sort of a ventilation thing for these uh these re- these rooms ruins but it wasn't they said no that's for the little people to come in and out of yeah have you ever have you ever heard that yeah yeah, the um, um, where I live. Let's see. All right, maybe I'll share that story next time. Um, okay, over in um Aljato, Miami Valley area. My um my uncle, he um him and his friends were driving on the dirt roads. No one is supposed to drive on the dirt roads around there at night because there is werewolves. You know all the stuff. So it's one of the most creepiest roads that you'll ever you'll ever uh, see in your you ever see in your life or experience driving upon. You know, it's just a different vibe and all in itself. So I guess he went and um, his uh, car went and gave out on that road, and he said that thankfully the moon was out, 
and he sat up, up on top of the car while one of his friends went to the nearest house to see if they can help him out. And he said it was just quiet. Him and a few people were there. They were just quiet. And um, they heard a, a weird howl, like someone was saying, Aah! and, you know, they looked over to the side, you know, to the left side, like on top of the hill. He said he seen what exactly like a gnome looking like little person on top of that little tiny hill and there's bushes around. There's no trees. This is the desert part of Mimet Valley. And um and made another call again, he said. And then out of out of the ground these little things start popping up out of the ground. And they started uh, walking around to different hills and digging into the bushes and retrieving something. And the one that was making the howl was looking out. And I guess they said they realized that that, that little person in Nome was looking at him. And then when the other person see, seen it and they're like, oh my gosh, did you see that? What is that? And I guess it made another howl. And all of those little people, they went back into the little holes, you know, and then like um, my in-laws say uh, Navajo Mountain, they actually, there's a, a like a little, a little city inside of it, you know, they, they live inside of it and they call them the wild, the last wild Indians. <laughs> and when you go hiking around it, um, every now and then you hear people speaking in a gibberish language. And my in-laws, they went uh tried to sneak up to it. And they said that when they looked up over the ledge, they seen two little, uh, like uh, two little natives, you know, two little Navajos, or not Navajos, two little uh, Indians, all with the bow and arrow, you know, with the whole attire looking at them, but just, just small. And they took off. I guess one of them had his bow about to, let it go of my brother-in-law. So, you know, those are the, some of the two stories that, you know, I know about and, and I've yet to go up there. I'm, I'm always willing to go up there to, to these places myself. I, I just have a hard time trying to find at least two more adults. You know, it's just me and my German shepherd. <laughs> and I have a machete. That's all I got. But there's a, there's a <laughs> lot of places here. <laughs> I'm about to, but uh, I'll try to listen to wise counsel. Um, <laughs> from where I live, from where I live, like about two miles, um, uh, my my labor um, that I work with, he he told me that he lives by a portal. He showed me on Google Maps, and he said that um, they they go up it's where his grandma lives. Not really, no one lives around that area. So they would go down a ways, and he said that uh, a little portal will open up with a red outlining, and it's dark inside. And he said two little uh, gnomes looking popped out, and they're walking along the creek, and they're talking to each other in that weird gibberish language, and they're pointing around. They're having a full-blown conversation with each other, and he said another portal opened up, boom, and they went in there. And then he said another time, they went over there, it opened up, and he said a pterodactyl flew out of there. And he was flying around in the sky, he said it was a huge pterodactyl. It was screeching, soaring, and it went back, and then another portal opened up, and it flew right in there. And he said another time it opened up, and a raptor came out. A full-blown dinosaur raptor, he said came out running around and the portal opened up and ran in. And then he told me the UFO, have you seen a UFO come out? So, you know, I have all these places. I have a list of uh, places forbidden. <laughs> There's a place called Skeleton Mesa, you know, we're all told to stay off of, but I'm always the one saying, why, why, why? And then they tell me like, oh yeah, and then, and then, and then what? But, yeah, just having a hard time finding like-minded people to do my own investigations like that here on the res and to put it out there and to share with you guys. But maybe that'll be one day. 
I'm not sure. Well, you know, there's a longstanding history in the Four Corners region of uh, you saying that about the dinosaurs, uh, that they still say that they see raptors, uh, what they they call little little T-Rexes. Uh, people see have mm. sightings of those in the Four Corners regions uh, all the time. Oh, really? And in fact, I, I had a friend that lived in Cortez, uh, Colorado, and uh, uh, we had gone to visit her. Of course, this has been probably 20 years ago, but... Um, we had stopped in to visit her and she had actually, they had had, uh, there was, uh, you know, the talk of the town at that point in time was somebody had come in and was claiming that they had seen um, these uh, and they're only like three or four feet tall. They're not big, huge things, you know, but that they were mm-hmm. running around out there in this uh, 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 ravine that they had run into them. Mm-hmm. So. So that sounds all exciting. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, the, the, you hear stories like that all the time. So yeah. uh, I, I totally believe what you're saying. Yeah, it's 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 all gonna it's all coming out there, you know. Like this day and age, you know, something about it, you know, it's probably all going down to the end, and they're all coming out of hiding, maybe. But. You know the questions out there. You know, and the same thing with um, Bigfoot. You know, I'm always uh, I started getting into it and you know researching, and I have yet to buy uh, buy um, Will's books. You know, I have I have a list of books that I want to get, but um, one day I'll get into this full research. But right now, you know, I'm just enjoy listening to you guys' podcasts and getting any information and like life-saving tips that I can get from you guys. Hey, Don, if you email me your mailing address, yeah. I'll send you copies of my books. Oh, really? Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll be I'll be able to pay you. Yeah. Oh, don't worry about I that. Just, um, don't worry about that. Okay. Um, where where I live is just like a rule. We, we go by P.O. boxes, so it's, it's pretty hard to get anything from out there. Okay. You're like, no, you have to have a physical address. I'm like, Dave. Yeah, just just send me a mailing address <laughs> where, where a box will come to. All right. Yeah, that sounds really good. I would I would like to see it and show my family because uh, you know all of my my family they all support my little uh, my little hobby. I would say, you know, I have my questions, and every time we get a chance, I try to get a few in laws and. You know that's what we that's what we did last time we got to we found tracks and you know I believe that they're all out there and you know I'm sure they're running around still <laughs> at this very moment. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, there's more stories too, more accounts, but I think it's gonna keep going on and on. But you guys have me. Uh, I don't want to sound like I'm going on and on. I want to know if you guys have any any more questions or. Anything like that. Chuck, Forrest, Tom, you guys have any more questions? or? I think we're going to have to take you up on your offer to come out and visit you. And uh, I just can't thank you enough, Don, that you reached out to us and with some very fascinating history that, you know, and I have some of my other Native American friends who are saying the exact same thing, parallels what you're saying. So, some point we're gonna have to come out there <clears throat> and meet up we'll have a campfire in i don't know forest are you up for that Chuck? oh yeah i'm up for that yep uh i want his phone number before he leaves uh or forest, uh, gets I, off the air here forest i already sent it to you oh you, oh you did okay good good deal good deal good deal awesome yeah nice and nice um yeah it's it's a you guys are the first um show that i like share my experience with you know and it's, i listen to other people's um point of view on bigfoot sasquatch you know some of them are okay but you know like listening to you guys and sasquatch chronicles you know you guys are the first two podcasts that really i think took this serious you know like saying that hey there is something out here let's really sink down to earth you know there's something out there a little bit bigger, stronger, and faster than us. Well, and, when you see one, you know they're there, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I wouldn't mind seeing them again because I have 
have, I have my own questions too. And, you know, I wouldn't mind, you know, doing what you guys do, but you guys are, you guys are the professionals. You guys know more than me. So I'm, I'm always going to listen to you guys. Well, Don, I, but when it comes out here, yeah, I, I sent you a text. So you'd be able to contact me anytime you want with questions. And actually we're seriously talking about moving to New Mexico next year. So, uh, I'll be much closer to where you are. Oh, yeah? What part of New Mexico? Uh, Las Cruces. Be in the southern part, but it's only a couple-hour drive up north, so... Oh, yeah. Yeah, a pretty magical drive. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of places to check out there. It's a pretty nice nice uh, southwest, man. You know, um, I, right now I'm getting... I'm fixing to move to uh, Page, Arizona. And we got the Escalante right there. I guess um, that whole area from um, Escalante Grand Staircase to Bears Ears, all the way to Richfield, Utah. We've we've got a, we've got an active uninhabited place. Yeah, we've got an active area um, right now on the border of uh, Arizona, New Mexico. Lots and lots of tracks, so lots of stuff going on in that region. Yeah, there is, and there's not many people at all. No. I think that's why, and that's the beauty of it. <laughs> Well, my favorite place in the whole world is Moab, Utah. So, um, I, oh I, yeah, I, oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We used yeah, to go into Moab uh -huh. for our um, and for our Friday night meals, and I was just like, man, I could just, you know, back then I could buy land out there for twenty five dollars an acre, and now you probably couldn't. I don't even want to imagine because you got all your movie stars and everything else that are moving out there. But um, I, yeah. I just love Moab in that area. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, my my uncle lives out there right now. He he his story. He had a um, bigfoot crawl in the window on him, and he had did a, what? Um, did wait, wait, what? Did you just say crawl. it crawled in the window? Yeah, it crawled in the window back in um, 90, 99, 2000, the summer. Um. Yeah, my great grandma was alive. Then she was uh she told him. He was a grandson that she can always trust to, you know, take care of things. And she loved him. She raised him. So he was in uh, Moab. She told him something's always coming around, smacking the trailer, trying to open the door, screaming. And she's an old, my great grandma was a really old lady. She was still alive. She was trying to tell him, wish that, come in, come in. And I guess the door was open, but something was just reaching in with her arms. So she told him he came down, I guess, that night. He slept the whole day that night. Um, uh, he was in the closet. He left the closet about like two inches, one inch crack. It was the old school, like the 80s uh, trailers with a sliding door, right? And he was in the middle room, and um, he left the window cracked open. He was sitting there. He had a, he had a uh, bull mastiff. Her name was Suma. Really loyal dog. She he taught that dog. He taught her how to hunt, how to, you know, a whole bunch of outdoor. He was a really outdoor person, and I guess he trained it too to be quiet. And he said that he felt the breeze, a nice cool breeze coming through the window, and it hit him. And he said he dozed off to sleep, and he, the way how he snapped out of it was a. Uh, his dog headbutting him, boom, headbutting his face and licking his face and headbutting him. And he finally came to, he's like, oh, my dog's licking me up. My dog's licking me and he started snapping up. And he looked in the crack of the wind, uh, the closet again, and he said that he saw huge, two huge arms and uh, trying to reach in and the other arm reach out and then the uh, arm like a left arm reached in all the way to its shoulders and its head came in, but it was too wide and it and it reached itself out and it was trying to wiggle itself in, wedge itself in. And he said that he was, when he realized that it was doing, trying to come in, he, he jumped back, he jumped up and he jumped to the corner of the closet. He just, he just freaked out and he grabbed his um, dog he kicked open the door. He threw his dog right towards it. And um, Suma, he said she just turned into a missile and just tackled that 
he said it was a monkey. He's all it looked like orangutan silverback trying to crawl in the window, he said. And the dog just smacked, tackled it, boom, right back out the window. <laughs> and I guess they fell, boom, and he said he can hear his dog fighting and and he stumbled out the door. He was stumbling down the hallways. He was like, Something happened to him. You know, the wind hit him. But uh um, we we're not really sure, but he thinks that it was like witchcraft type of deal too. But he said that wind breeze put him to sleep. He doesn't know how to explain it. So he finally got to the door. He stumbled all the way to the door, and then he turned his flashlight on. He said the Bigfoot and his dog were rolling towards the truck. They were fighting and rolling, and they they got underneath the truck, and I guess he heard a. He heard uh, his dog, you know, started screaming, and I guess he, he, um, his dog crawled out from the truck, and he shined his light up, and he saw that thing running really fast. He said down the road, and then he had he pointed his rifle ahead of it towards the hill. He knew where it was gonna go. There's not much trees around there in Douglas Mesa, but we're pretty high elevation still. So when it got to the top of that, before it got to the top of that hill, you know, he had a British 303 rifle, and he he let it around go, boom, and he said that it hit right on the head, right on time. He said that he heard a like a huge uh, smack, and he said that he saw the bullet ricocheting, flying, and it was whistling, going all the way up to the to the sky. The bullet was on fire. Then the bullet came back down, and then the fire went out of the bullet. The bullet dropped somewhere. And um, so he heard it screaming, and he said he heard it falling. Boom. And he said he heard it running. Dun, dun, dun. Boom. Dun, dun, dun. Still screaming and falling and running until it got quiet. Yeah, that's that's one of the... He has a lot of stories, you know, which he can share with you guys. <laughs> But I got to go find well, Don, more at. Yeah, we're going to do oh. it. <clears throat> tell you, we're running short on time. But I got to tell you, it's a real treat having you on today. And and you're not going to get away from us that easily. So we're going to have you back. Isn't that right, Will? Absolutely. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> All right. That sounds, that sounds awesome, man. It's a, it's a real honor. You know, it's a... Oh, well, the honor is ours. It's been a real pleasure, Don. Oh, yeah, yeah Don. Fascinating life. stories. Thank you. Oh yeah, I think uh, maybe one of these one of these days I can meet you guys and put a name to you guys' faces. Absolutely. Oh, you yeah. will. Absolutely. Yeah, I like to learn. I like to learn from you guys and work with you guys one day, if you know, Lord willing. Oh, you got it. Two way street, um, buddy. You got it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, man. All right. Well, you guys have a good one. God bless you guys. All right. Take care. You too. Thanks, All Tom. Right. All right. All right. right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's william, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.